All right, we might make a start. So we're on time, yeah. Yep. We might make a start. Uh, so welcome everyone for the Fostering Community Support and Tourism. So this is the final day and final session. So I thought I would start off with some light humour for everyone. Um, and this is inspired by Taylor's dad joke this morning. Um, so what is the best music to listen to when you go fishing? Another one by Sadas. Oh, that's a good one. No, but something really catchy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. All right, that, that's, out, that's out of the way now. Um, so the first speaker is Karina Ryan, and she is going to be speaking about exploring variability in recreational fishing by fisher demographics and fishing behaviour. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land in which we meet and all First Nations people here today. I'm really happy to be back in Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung country. I have lots of special memories here. Today I'm going to be talking about marine fishing off Bulu, which is Perth, in Noongar country in Western Australia and many traditional countries throughout the state. Participation broadly quantifies the number of fishes in a population and is often the primary metric that defines recreational fishing activity. Fishers are very heterogeneous in terms of their demographics and their fishing behaviour. And understanding the temporal and spatial variability in participation is important for many fisheries, policies and regional initiatives, including fishing tourism. The aim of today's talk is to investigate variability in participation in terms of fisher demographics and fishing behaviour from a case study of boat-based marine recre rec recreational fishing in Western Australia. So we know that more than 600,000 people go recreational fishing in Western Australia and about 130,000 of those fish from a boat in marine waters. The survey data that we're talking about today has been collected over 10 annual surveys from 2011 to 2021 and it's allowing a comparison of participation both spatially and temporally. Many jurisdictions in Australia use a multi-stage survey design. Um, it has an initial screening survey which is a cross-sectional <coughs> one-off survey, a longitudinal phone diary survey and in our state we run a follow-up benchmark survey which is essentially a repeat of the screening survey. So we've run five statewide surveys now which means we've got ten of these cross-sectional surveys that we can compare over time. Um, with the, um, the screening surveys, we collect information about people's past fishing, um, where they've been, how many days they recalled they fished. We also collect motivation information and some um, attitudinal information, which I won't be reporting on today. And I'm also going to be excluding data that is for people that only went freshwater fishing from a boat or did shore-based fishing only. But that's only about 2% of people because our sample is drawn from the recreational boat fishing licence sampling frame. So the demographic variables that we're looking at are residents, gender and age. So residence is based on 11 regional commission boundaries. Um, these are defined by the state. They closely align with the ABS statistical areas. Um, most of the population live in the Perth metro area, so quite a small area there, and that's where more than half of the population reside, and half of our boat-based fishers live in that area. Um, behavioural variables for this study were avidity, bioregion and fishery type. So avidity is measured in terms of the numbers of days fished in the past 12 months by recall, and it provides a measure of fisher knowledge or experience. Fishery types are defined by depth-based habitat categories which align with management regions. So you can see here, this is a summary of effort, that the majority of effort, 62%, is done in nearshore fishing and 10%, 25% is done in inshore demersal. And management regulations allow mixed species bag limits that are unique for each habitat type. So fish are aligned to a habitat type, regardless if they might move in between them. Um, fish do move, so. Um, so now to some figures. 
So this is a stacked bar chart on the left and it shows the estimated participation for each of the residential regions. And as you can see, the highest participation comes from licence holders in the Perth metro region. What we're seeing the colours or the groups within each bar, sorry, the order of the regions is from north to south. So from the tropical regions in the north, like the Kimberley and the Pilbara, down through the temperate regions in the south, like the Goldfields, Esperance and the Albany areas. And the row on the bottom is interstate fishers. We do include them because they are required to buy a licence when they come to fish in WA. So in this graph, you can see that the colours are showing the proportion of female to male fishers. So in the Perth metro area, it's about 90% of the fishers are male. And on the left-hand side, you can see the participation as a percentage. So that measure of male to female participants is pretty consistent across all residential areas. There's a slightly higher participation of females in the northern areas of the state. So here the chart on the left shows participation by regions with groups defining um, five different age classes. So again, the largest bars, Perth Metro, consistent theme, and the majority of fishers in the Perth Metro are in the 30 to 44 years of age group. The percentage figure on the right shows that the proportion of 30 to 44 year olds is highest in tropical <coughs> regions and then as you get down to the more southern regions you tend to get a higher proportion of fishers aged 45 years or above. Now we're looking at a summary of the um, avidity of fishers. So you can see highest participation in Perth Metro and more than half of the participants fish more than 15 days or more in the previous 12 months. But you can see from the figure on the right that the proportion of avids to non-avids, the red bars to the other coloured bars, changes across all the different residential strata. So if you are a resident of the Kimberley or the Pilbara or the Gascoigne, then you're more likely to fish 15 days or more than if you're a resident of um, the southern regions. So this is a summary of where people go fishing. And so in the Perth metro area, about 80% of people fish in the West Coast bioregion. So fish, people in Perth Metro tend to fish lo locally. This is quite a broad area. It goes from just north of Kalbarri down to Albany. Um, but what you do see also is that there's a reasonable proportion of non-local fishing that occurs in the North Coast, the Gascoigne Coast and the South Coast by Perth Metro residents. However, if you're a resident of the Kilburn, Kimberley or the Pilbara, then you're more likely to fish locally in the north coast. And likewise, if you're a resident of the Great Southern or the Goldfields, you're more likely to fish in the south coast. So what we see is that fishers that live in tropical regions mostly fish in their local areas. And fishers that fish in the southern regions most likely fish in their local areas. And why wouldn't they? There's great fishing both in the north and the south of the state. So we're now going to show you just a summary of effort and catch from the statewide survey, the phone diary component, just to point out that effort and catch on a statewide basis is more highly concentrated in the West Coast bioregion. 73% of the effort statewide occurs in the West Coast bioregion and 78% of the catch. And you can also see it by looking at the relative proportions of the catches, the harvest of the demersal scale fish. So dewfish has an annual harvest of around above 100 tonnes per year, whereas um, in the other regions, red emperor, pink snapper and bite redfish in the south coast have an annual harvest of about 10 tonnes. So we can see that the majority is occurring locally there. So in this figure here, I'm going to try and talk you through it. This is showing the results of looking at it from the aspect of bioregion fished and fishery type. So you can see the four bioregions up the top and the top group is the demersal fishery and the bottom group is the near, so near shore fisheries. And this time I'm showing the data temporally. So you can see over the 10 years from 2011 to 2021. So what you can see from this is that the majority of participation is occurring in the West Coast bioregion for both the demersal fishery and the nearshore fishery. And on average, that's the red dotted line, just under 40,000 licensed fishers out of the 130,000 fish in a demersal fishery in the West Coast on every year. Whereas in the West Coast bioregion, about 60,000 people go fishing for nearshore species. 
But what we also see is that the majority of fishing in the west coast is by local residents, which is the gold bars. In contrast, the Gascoigne region, you're seeing a lot of non-local fishing going on. And in the Gascoigne region, we have a, lot, um, a residential population that's very low. I, it's below 5,000. It's very small. Um, number of towns there. So people travel quite a lot from all over the place to go into the Gascoigne region. Um, so just in summary, understanding variability in participation influences how recreational fisheries are monitored and managed. And, we can, and it can be used to inform development and evaluation of meaningful indicators for recreational fisheries. So this case study contributes to a broader issues regarding the impact of fisher heterogeneity um, for monitoring and managing recreational fisheries. And it improves our understanding of how the recreational sector responds to changes in resource availability and management. And finally, I'd like to thank recreational fishers that participated in our surveys. Each year we have about 5,000 people complete the screening or the benchmark surveys. Um, we have a research agreement with ECU and the Survey Research Centre conduct all the surveys on the behalf of the department. Alyssa Tate, Brent Wise and Steve Taylor have provided enormous support over all the years to our surveys and all of our work is done under Human Research Ethics Committee approval. And thank you for listening. <laughs>So we do have a couple of minutes if anyone would like to fire a quick question away. If there's any burning questions before we jump into Taylor. Yep. Um, especially with the gas line, that traveller from... Oh. With the gas line area, um, did you delve into the amount of effort coming in from the fly and fly out workers or was it all just looped in that general tourism area? We did initially try to look at how we could um, identify people as being fly in, fly out. It's really difficult to do. And I think it fell back to just looking at home postcodes and what their residential region were because fly in, fly out people can fly from interstate and Albany, Calbarry, they live all over the place. They could be flying up into the Kim Kimberley Pilbara and also the Gascoigne. Thank you. So next we have Taylor Hunt. So Taylor will be speaking about the partnership approach to save an Australian threatened native freshwater fish species from extinction, our beloved Macquarie perch. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> uh, thanks, Braden. Thank you all for coming. I know last session, Wednesday after the gala dinner, keep those eyelids open if you can. Appreciate you being here. Uh, so as Braden said, I'm talking about uh, Macquarie perch, which, which is a threatened endangered native fish species. And this really is a partnership approach. It's not just a story that I'm telling, but there's a whole heap of people who are contributing to bringing back Macquarie perch. And some of their names are listed there. In particular, Shay Bloom from the Women in Wreck Fishing Network, Andrew Briggs from the North East CMA, Luke Pearce from New South Wales Fisheries, the VFA team, and there's a few in the audience here. Steve Viddler's there with his Macquarie Perch tattoo. Travis Dowling leads us and loves Macquarie Perch. And there's a whole heap of us kicking in, including wreck fishers. So I want to say this is bigger than just a couple of us. We're all working on this together. But firstly, let me introduce you to the Macquarie Perch. So this is, I think, a pretty fish. Uh, it was once the most abundant midland and upland native fish species. There's stories about Macquarie perch going up rivers to spawn and the rivers are so black with Macquarie perch that they're scaring the horses uh, and the horse, horsemen on the back and the their horses won't cross the river because there's so many Macquarie perch in there. Uh, they were once a really popular and productive sport fish as well. So fished really hard. Um, Travis and Steve remember catching them right up until the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and there's these accounts of amazing spawning runs up rivers throughout Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. But sadly, like a lot of our native fish, a whole heap of factors have contributed to their demise. And they're the classic things that we hear um, for Murray Cod and Golden Perch. You know, we've taken out habitat, we've put barriers in our system for irrigation purposes, which uh, impacts the migration of fish. There has been overfishing 
And most recently for Macquarie Perch, there's been these bushfires, which have been absolutely devastating in the remnant places where we still find them. So now we're left with really a handful of discrete populations that are disconnected and the future outlook for this species is really bleak. You can see we've got about six uh, populations in Victoria. Some of those are translocated uh, in the orange and some of them are natural, but um, we're pretty quickly going down the tube at the current rate. This is where they used to be. So in all of our upland systems, the Murray-Darling Basin system, the Goulburn system, and going down in lesser abundance right down past Swan Hill. This is what we want to do and bring them back. And the feeling is, unless we act pretty soon, we'll be in really strife, real strife. We have had some progress on recovery over time, um, and there's been a lot of work done on this from fisheries, from CMAs, from research agencies. There's lots of habitat restoration, which is great, bringing them back where they already are. We've implemented more restrictive harvest limits, so there's only one place you can actually take Macquarie perch now. We understand their genetics, we've done population monitoring, and we have done quite a bit of fish production and stocking. But the really important point to note in this is to do our stocking, it all comes from wild brood stock. So we actually need to take wild fish out of the system to breed them to put these fish back. So we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Since 1990, we've stocked 700,000 Macquarie perch, which is great, but it's all been from wild brood stock. And the researchers are now telling us the place where we collect our brood stock from Lake Dartmouth probably has a timeline of about three years left that we can keep taking brood stock where we start hitting sustainability triggers and we'll deplete that population as well. The things aren't looking great, especially if you add on these impacts which are increasingly occurring. So we're going to have climate variability, we've seen floods, we're going to have droughts again, we will have more bushfires and most recently we've had redfin invade Lake Dartmouth and everywhere redfin have been they've absolutely hammered Macquarie perch. So things aren't great in terms of the outlook but we do have a really obvious case study that has proven to be successful for our other native fish and that is captive breeding, actually closing the loop and being able to breed Macquarie perch using hatchery brood stock, not using wild brood stock. And this has helped save Murray cod, silver perch, golden perch. A whole heap of other factors have contributed but in the 70s and the 80s, learning how to breed these things using hatchery technology made a big difference and we were able to stock them in big numbers and re-establish those populations. So that's the dream for Macquarie Perch. That's what we want to achieve. We've worked through this and in the last two years, we've really gotten serious about the recovery of Macquarie Perch. And we understand what we need to do, but we realise we need to share this story with other people. So it's been a campaign of raising awareness with anyone and everyone we can, but particularly with recreational fishing stakeholders and environmental managers as well. So we've written to a whole heap of partner organisations. We've developed websites. You've seen a heap of social media posts out there. We've built the Mates of Macquarie Perch Facebook page, which now has about a thousand members in the top right hand corner and we're talking about Macquarie Perch flat out. We even baked cakes for Macquarie Perch which are in the bottom left hand corner there. And some of the cakes are better than others but yeah, a whole heap of us had a go. We won a national award for baking those cakes which was pretty cool. And it was all an effort just to get people talking about Macquarie Perch and saying this story, if we don't do something soon, they are gonna go. Like they won't be extinct in five years, but they'll go past the point of no return. And I don't want that to happen on my watch and these guys don't want that to happen either. So we can do something about it and we're trying to share that story. We were successful in getting some funding from Landcare, which was really helpful. We made some improvements with fish production. We did some really good habitat restoration, which we know is important. We did some more, more stocking, but we also gave us the funds to do two videos or two engagement pieces, which I think has given us the profile that we didn't have before. And these two pieces were an iFish episode so iFish arguably is, I guess, uh, the most watched recreational fishing TV show. Um, it has a, a huge reach 
Paul Worsling is the uh, the presenter. He was at the dinner last night. And so we had an episode purely about Macquarie Perch. And there's Jared talking about cracking the code. So that went out to, you know, 20 million people. It's played all the time every Sunday. It's on YouTube as well. And it tells wreck fishers that we can bring Macquarie Perch back as a wreck fishing species. We also made a video or a film actually called Cracking the Code. And some of you might have seen this. Uh, it went to the Cairns Short Film Festival and was shortlisted, which we thought was really cool. Went to a couple of other film festivals, but it was shared widely on social media. And we think it tells a story much more articulately than I can do today about what we need to do for Macquarie Perch, crack the code. And we most recently put Macquarie Perch in Melbourne Aquarium here. So this is a northeastern uh, Murray-Darling Basin fish. So if you're visiting or if you're a Victorian who lives in Melbourne, you might never see a Macquarie Perch, but now you can go to the aquarium a million people walk through there every year. It's just down the road and you can see a Macquarie perch and hear the story about it. So we think all these things are contributing to building the awareness around Maccas. So with all of that effort, uh, late last year, we had the whole of popula population meeting for Macquarie perch. This is where all of the researchers, the managers, uh, anyone who's working around Macquarie perch come together and we talk about how's the species going. And it was sad, but it was also really encouraging. All the populations are on the decline, which we kind of know it's looking bad. But for the first time ever, we have everyone in agreement that the number one thing we need to do is captive breeding. We need to crack the code. And we're all focused on that at the moment. So we've built that momentum and build a essentially a, a program of work that we think we can crack the code within three years. It's focused on the two key knowledge gaps around nutrition and hormone optimization in the hatchery. We've got the best research experts in this space. We've secured co-investment, and we think we could translate that into the hatchery within three years, both in Victoria and New South Wales and in private hatcheries. So with that piece of work, uh, the community support that we've got, the fantastic habitat restoration that the CMAs are doing, there's more and more investment in habitat at the moment, and most recently, we've had the current Victorian government commit to $5 million for an upgrade at Snobs Creek, a captive breeding facility. Combined with our Crack the Code research, which is very close to going in the hole, as you can see, we think we've got the recipe there. So this is my story about bringing Maccas back that we're all working on. And I think we can save this iconic native fish and bring them back from, from extinction and bring them back as a recreational species. Thanks so much for listening. Sure. So we have some, uh, some time for two questions. Has anyone got any burning questions for Taylor? If not, we can move on to the no, next... I've got a question. Yep, Trav. So, so Taylor, you talk about them and you talk about the Murray Darling. Hi Taylor, you talk about them and you talk about the. <laughs> I should have mentioned Euroa. Yeah, yeah. No, well, no, but you, you talk about the Murray Darling Basin and look, you know, it's a wonderful presentation and, and I think, you know, everyone that loves native fish in Australia should see this presentation. But can you just explain a little bit about where they sit in the Murray Darling Basin? Like, you've sort of touched on it, but they're a little bit different to a catfish and a silver perch and a Murray cod based on the waters of the basin that they inhabit. And climate change is probably going to have a big impact also on where they're going to start moving. So can you explain a little bit more about, you know, you're not going to catch generally a Macquarie perch next to a Murray cod. So, so where, do, where do these fish live and you know, what should we be looking at there? Yeah, yeah, good question, Trav. So what we understand about Macquarie perch were traditionally more of an upland species, cold water species. So we have Murray cod golden perch in the lowland, the warmer Murray-Darling Basin waters and trout cod and Macquarie perch more in the cooler waters. There are some schools of thought though that they did spread down a bit further, but definitely more a cold water fish. So faster running water, uh, more extreme slopes um, in some of those impoundments as well and further upstream than down in the slower waters. So I just made the point, mate, so on that, as climate change is starting to, um, I suppose, provide different habitat for trout, which is code for, there are some areas that trout are probably going to start moving out of, mm. 
know, do you see a really big opportunity for Macquarie Perch to move into some of those clear water rivers, uh, which are probably more climate change uh, uh, resilient? Yep. to be able to provide those fishing opportunities in those waters. Yeah, absolutely, because, uh, like I said, they're a cold water species, but they have the ability to go into warmer water. So trout, we know, are very cold, and as the climate continues and these waters get warmer, we think it'll be more suitable for Macquarie perch, plus those habitats. So trout will get squeezed, and we're seeing that in our systems at the moment, moving further and further up, and we'll think it'll become more and more suitable for Macquarie perch. So. The habitat is working in our favour, but we do need to be able to breed them, get them back out there to be able to colonise those spots. Great question, Trav. Oh, hi. Um, you go into a lot of trouble doing you know, stocking and everything like that. Um, is there any thought about establishing populations in some of these, like as Travis was just saying, in those sort of areas and making them no-catch zones for protection? Well, they're almost completely protected at the moment. Um, and I think uh, the end goal is to bring them back as a recreational species, but um, we're a little way away from that. We need them to be a healthy, resilient um, population for a start to build them like that's happening in the ovens. We've almost got a uh, proof of concept there that if you put enough fish in, you can get them to build. And they're doing that in the ovens and they're spreading into the king. So I think initially, yeah, they will be no take. But eventually down the track, if they can become as abundant as, as Murray Cod and Golden Perch, we think the community can enjoy them again as well. And that's the ultimate goal for all of these recovery plans, to bring them back, uh, not just in the environment, but for the community as well. We think we can do both. We've probably got time for one more question, if anyone has any burning questions. If not, we can move on to the next present. Yep, one more. Thank you. Um, it seems to have got a lot of great initiatives to raise awareness and profile of this. Um, did you get together to put together a communications or engagement plan at the start to um, look at your strategies? We had, yeah, we had components, uh, but the whole thing wasn't embedded in a communication plan, so to speak. I guess we took every opportunity we could to raise profile um, and we had we just have a go basically um the key like the the land care project absolutely there was some discreet and those the video and the eye fish episode were pretty key but now you know getting them in uh the aquarium things like that there are opportunities that have popped up that we just try and grab and we stocked macquarie perch this week um with shay with andrew briggs with traditional owners there'll be some media on that uh, and there might be some interest um, popping up through media so we're trying to tell the story consistent, persistent, like what Sasha said yeah. about keep fish wet, and we think it's resonating. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it seems like a really good strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Yeah. So next we have uh, Brent. So Brent is going to be speaking on improving fishing opportunities through rock recreational fishing reefs. Thank you, Brent. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining this session, especially being so late in the conference, so really appreciate it. I begin today by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. The traditional custodians of the land which we meet here today and I pay my respects to their elders present and emerging and to all Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders. So just, um... There are good reasons for improving fish habitat and shellfish reefs. Overall there's a lack of habitat in Port Phillip. The substrate mainly consists of soft sand, mud and silt with little reef. Especially, uh, there's reef around the Port Phillip Heads area and isolated points, but overall it's mainly mud and silt. Also, the shellfish reefs are in decline. So the shellfish reefs were once abundant in Port Phillip prior to commercial dredge fishing and introduced species, such as the Northern Pacific um, Sea Star. We've got Bob Pierce here from the Albert Park Yachting and Angling Club, and he's been an advocate for restoring the shellfish, so I'm honoured for him to be here. 
And the shellfish provided a rich source of food for the Wadarong people. And the, the Wadarong people were the traditional owners of where we place the, um, the rock reefs. So the benefit with increased fish, fish habitat uh, benefits underwater biodiversity, hence it benefits recreational anglers. And the Victorian Fisheries Authority, we've successfully installed reefs throughout Victoria and Port Phillip. We've got some fantastic reefs on the other side of the port in Curran Bight, um, some reef ball reefs, and that's a fantastic snapper fishery over there. And the benefits of seeding the reefs with shellfish is they provide structural habitat and a food source for the fish. They improve water quality via filtration. We've learned that from a lot of other talks here, this conference, and it provides brood stock for future shellfish population and hopefully that will um, help restore the reef. So we've got some images there. That left image, um, we took that on a mussel reef in the Gippsland Lakes and as Bob knows, that's what much of Port Phillip used to look like. We've got some commercial dredged fishes, probably from the 70s in the middle and that image on the right, that's actually where the um, rock reefs were installed. To increase both fish habitat and, ha and shellfish reefs, the Victorian Fisheries Authority have installed rock recreational fishing reefs. And the objectives of these reefs are to improve fish habitat for both land and boat-based fishers, and also to build productive shellfish fishing reefs with benefits to improve water quality, benthic habitat, and productivity to support key fish and invertebrate species, especially snapper. That's um, a good one. And you see um, that middle image there, that as soon as we put some rock down in the middle of the Geelong Arms, I'm not sure if you can see that big snapper came, that's like after the rock was down. So as soon as you put habitat um, down, the fish will come. So, and also to increase the scale of the reefs and shellfish broodstock. So the reefs were installed in the um, uh, 2020. Um, they're in the Geelong arm of Port Phillip. Um, that's the local port of Melbourne in Victoria, um, Australia. And when deciding on the location, we consulted the fishing community. So these are in areas where there's traditionally good fishing. Also the fishing stakeholders, and we've got a, some stakeholders here. We've got, we consulted um, Future Fish and Victorian Recreational Fishing Peak Body, VR Fish and they helped work out a location. Then we used GIS constraint mapping. So we just uh, used the mapping just to ensure that the reefs don't conflict with fragile um, um, marine environments such as seagrass. And they're also in areas where there was previous lost shellfish reefs. When naming the reefs, the Wadarong people named one of the reefs, and they named the reef Moolap, and Moolap means man fishing with spear. So that's the original name of Point Henry. So see that little hook on the, on the bottom of the Geelong arm? So that resembles a man fishing with spear, and so the same name of the suburb directly south of the reef. So hopefully this creates um, awareness to the cultural significance of the sea country to the Wadarong people. The other two reefs were named Merv's Reef, and that's named in the, late, in the memory of late Merv Maguire. So he was a major contributor to the recreational um, fishing community for over 20 years. And also Wilson's Reef, and that was named after a local fishing legend and author, which many of you will know, Jeff Wilson. So the reefs were designed uh, to optimise fish habitat um, uh, creating a large footprint whilst maintaining fish uh, movement connectivity. So this Merz Reef on the left, that's a fantastic um, urban fishing uh, spot. So that's right really close into um, Geelong and people can fish there literally from the back of their car, catch a big snapper and even kingfish. So um, the reefs are located 62 metres from the shore, so that's just beyond um, casting distance and entanglement. And each cl cluster is about 40 metres apart, just to, to spread the footprint away. The other two reefs are Moolap and Wilson's Reef. Um, they're two boat-based reefs, and they're designed for ease of navigation from the vessel and underwater. So they're installed in the four cardinal directions and evenly spaced 10 metres apart, one and a half metres high. 
Um, so when, you, when we're scuba diving monitoring, we can just easily move from one reef to another, um, just using our compass, and you should be able to do the same with the vessel. So they're designed to work together to maintain the fish aggregations and fish movement connectivity. The foundation of the reefs is made up of uh, basalt and limestone. So VR fish sourced 2,000 tonnes of basalt, and that was reused from a jail development at Cherry Creek in between um, Geelong and Melbourne. And these large rocks, they provide uh, great uh, fish habitat and a good base for the reef. So you find a lot of ling has uh, already moved into the big uh, basalt around the big basalt boulders. And a big uh, challenge for installing a reef in this area is when you actually dive, you can't feel the, 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 the sediment. It's so soft, your hand just goes straight through. So we'll put a pole like a metre and a half down. So about a one metre of this basalt is sacrificial rock that just creates a base for the rest of the reef. Um, the limestone, there's 100 uh, tonnes of limestone that's topped on top of the reef. Um, and that's a preferred substrate for shellfish settlement. So it's a good combination. And another challenge was loading 100 uh, truckloads of rock onto the barge. And the city of Greater Geelong provided a great loading space at Mackey Street Wharf, right next to Merz Reef. So it was installed by uh, Polaris Marine. And they used a long reach excavator. And it was um, positioned by hydraulic spuds. And there's a GPS. Uh, positioning system and a depth sound on the actual bucket so the rock could be uh, installed very accurately. Um, the Torridge tub that had a multi-beam scanner on it, so we receive multi-beam scans during and after installation. So you can see, see, see the accuracy of the multi-beam scan. On the right is, um, that's Wilson's Reef. You can see that actually the individual rocks um, uh, just around the reef. And from this good drone footage there, you see um, on the left, uh, Geelong, just, just in the background. So just amazing um, urban fishing spot. The reefs were seeded with native mussels and oysters. So 80,000 native blue mussels were seeded onto the reef. And that was sourced locally from an aquaculture farm. And... And they're, they're also good filter feeders. And also 400,000 baby native flat oysters. So Austria and Ghazi were also um, seeded onto the reefs. The, the oysters were first seeded onto two cubic metres of scallop shell. And that was given to us by the Nature Conservancy and the, the good you know, work they're doing restoring the reefs as well. And then the Victorian shellfish hatchery then reared these baby um, oysters. And then seeding the mussels, the mussels were dispersed by a bivalve blaster. So there's Kena diving services. They've came up with this invention on the left there. So it's a big pipe connecting from the, from the vessel down to the reefs, just high pressurised water, and they can just seed high quantities of mussels. So it's a pretty impressive image on the left. And the oysters on the scallop shells, they were just seeded on the reefs just by scuba diving by hand, spreading them around. So, and any of this excess um, shell creates a good base, any extra shells, good base on this soft sediment. So the Victorian Fisheries Authority, we're monitoring the reefs for two years. So the objectives of the monitoring are to determine the fish abundance and diversity compared to areas of no reef. Also to describe, um, investigate and describe the associated underwater life and to monitor the growth and survival of the seeded mussels and oysters. And we've used three different monitoring methods. We've heard a lot about the um, baited remote underwater videos, the BRUVs. Um, we also did underwater visual, survey, underwater visual swim, surveying the fish. So that's like the, the reef life surveys and shellfish investigations. So each of these sites had a control site. And the bruvs were definitely the monitoring method of choice. Because this area um, often might look clear on the top, but you may be lucky to get two or three metres visibility. So it's really hard to monitor the race, especially with underwater um, visual swims. Um, so yeah, there's a few still shots of the, um, the bruv monitoring um, around the top. So you can see lots of, um, lots of 
pinkies around there, leather jackets. The bottom left has got the gummy shark. Um, in the top right is the Brav um, camera itself. So they're deployed quarterly for two years, totaling 96 drops. So every season we do the Brav monitoring. And we've almost completed the first year of the Brav monitoring. So there's a, just a preliminary graph there. So just showing the three seasons, the blue lines, um, the, just shows the abundance of the fish compared to the orange line is the control site. So you see a greater abundance in, um, in spring and summer. Yeah, thanks. Here's a, um, just a one minute video. Um, hopefully this shows. And this is the reefs just, this is um, one year after deployment. So as you can see, the reefs are bringing in the key fish species that we're all after, but also the real pretty, a um, lot of invertebrates, ascidians and sea stars and other marine life as well. So present day, now we have um, a natural looking large reef ecosystem, which was once in an area of just sand and silt. As you can see from... Um, Oh, especially that image on the top left, you can see the, um, the oysters, it's a bit hard to see, they look like um, mouths, oysters with a sponge on, a lot of um, oysters there now. It's a nursery ground for key fish species, heaps of pinkies on the reefs. There's been a poor survival of mussels. We found that the mussels, I think that they were bred in the water column from the aquaculture farm and they didn't survive, or most didn't survive, um, being dispersed on the reef, but this would have provided great uh, food for the fish and also additional shell base doesn't hurt. And there's reports of good sized fish being caught. So this lady Mahana, she caught those pinkies there. If you read the latest um, fishing monthly magazine, there's, there's another lady with a huge snapper they caught on the reef and also reports of kingfish caught on the reef as well. So uh, VFA have continued their habitat enhancement programs and Last year we put in the Kingfish Reef um, with Subcon and that's to attract recreational fishing boats away from fishing in the dangerous shipping channels, particularly around the rip area. So we, we're excited to monitor this next. And located within Port Phillip Heads and that was 16 20 ton modules laid out in clusters of four and in areas of uh, yellowtail kingfish angling here. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's in an area where there was historic yellow tail kingfish um, caught and situated away from fragile marine environments. And just lots of people to thank, uh, the, the stakeholders, VR Fish, uh, divers, we've got one over there, Ben, Ben Cleveland, uh, Chris Padavoni, Corey Green, um, TNC, Shellfish Hatchery, um, Streamline Media, put all that together, the Water On Community, and John Holland Group and the Department of Justice for letting us reuse their rock. Thank you, Brent. Um, we'll move straight on to the next presentation, which is Ben Dolan. So if you have any questions for Brent, hold back at the end, please. So Ben is going to be speaking about 20 years of a New South Wales fish devices program, more than just passing FAD. Thank you, Ben. 
Thanks, Braden. Uh, for everyone that I haven't met yet, I'm a Senior Recreational Fisheries Manager with New South Wales Fisheries. I uh, grew up in Geelong, just down the road here. Uh, moved to Port Stephens in New South Wales about 20 odd years ago. And main reason for that is the fishing's just so much better there, isn't it, Taylor? <laughs> but I'll give it to you, you know how to do a good conference. Definitely. So I currently oversee the DPI Fisheries, Enhance, uh, Fisheries Enhancement Program. So this is for the offshore artificial reefs and the FADS program. So Chris will cover the offshore reefs very shortly. So the, I guess the main objective is that we, we want to improve recreational fishing opportunities by providing high quality fishing locations. So yesterday, Dan Smith covered a bit of background on what fads are. Uh, there's a lot of scientific debate around exactly why they work. So some species like striped marlin or even blue marlin, they're likely to turn up around a fad if there's prey actually present. Whereas other species such as dolphin fish, they seem to be attracted to the structure, uh, just the structure alone. So possibly for use as a rest, resting place or as a geographical reference point for feeding or for school recomposition. Felicity covered yesterday some of the Queensland work where fish have jumped between multiple fads and back and forward, so it's quite amazing how they find these things in the ocean. Uh, some of the other species, the, the main one we want to target in New South Wales is dolphin fish. Uh, extremely fast growing, highly fecund, uh, amazing sport fish and really good eating, so the, the fishers really want to, want to get into them. They sometimes attract wahoo as well, and um, marlin on occasions too. So on the New South Wales FAD, some of the past research showed that 95% of the recreational catch is of dolphin fish. We also often see kingfish, um, especially in the winter months. So we have a seasonal program where we remove these FADs during the cooler months just so we can focus on these dolphin fish. So where it all began, back in the 1990s, oh sorry, 1980s, some trials commenced in New South Wales. Uh, the designs were large and cumbersome very difficult to, to, to deploy and the maintenance costs were through the roof as well. So it was, it was trialled for a short term and then yeah, it all f fell through. Then in 2001, the New South Wales Recreational Fishing Licence Fee was introduced in the establishment of the Recreational Fishing Trust. Uh, the New South Wales Government introduced some key initiatives to enhance opportunities for recreational fishers throughout the state and that included the FADS program. So the following year, December 2002, the first FADs were deployed uh, under this program and five of them were, were rolled out that season. So early on, it was, it was working out what, what gear would be best, uh, wanted cost effective and small designs that you could easily retrieve and, and could also withstand some of the, the harsh conditions of the East Coast. Sometimes we're looking at four knots of current on these FADs and even maximum wave heights of up to 15 metres on occasion. So the following year, uh, the program was expanded to 10 FADs in 0304. Uh, 10 year, nine years later, up to 25 FADs. 30 FADs by 2015-16, and now we're currently up to 34 FADs. So the key, some of the key findings in those early days were that the FADs really needed to be exposed to the East Australian current. So up the far north coast, generally by about September, you've got the current running, running hard, the fish are turning up there. But then it takes quite a bit longer to reach the south coast where it's certainly down there now, but you do get this, this lag time until the water arrives. And then some of the early fads as well, which were placed in shore in closer, they just simply weren't effective. They attracted juvenile kingfish, mainly undersized ones, and we don't really want ta um, anglers targeting the undersized species there. Typically, if the water's above 20 degrees, you can find them, but 24 degrees seems to be the, the sweet spot for them. And typically, the greater numbers, like I was saying, the further offshore we get these fads. So they're still, still up on the continental shelf, but typically about 10 kilometres or more. The longest run's about 30 kilometres that we have to, to the Eden fad. Uh, when we place them, we typically try and, and land the, the anchors on top of reef just for stability during the season and, and less risk of drag. So for our international guests, uh, New South Wales, it's a state north of Victoria. Uh, you see in the middle there, that's the, the north coast down about the central coast. So you can see we've, we've got a fair spread of fads there out of most of the main, main fishing ports. And on the right hand side, so that's from Port Stephens down to, down to Eden. So we've now got fads at 34 locations. 
Uh, four of the Sydney locations, we've got paired fads there, so they're placed about 300 metres apart, and that's just to spread a bit of fishing effort uh, where there's a hell of a lot of fishers like to get out there and target fish on these fads. So with time, design kept on being modified until we're pretty satisfied with what we currently use. Um, we had to make sure, though, that we could fully recover all the deployed materials. So in the past, we did this from the from the six-metre Edencraft boat. We could do about two fads, those all we could hold. Uh, use a pot hauler to, to retrieve those, and occasionally they'll get snagged up, but for the most part, we're able to retrieve them. Uh, they need to be highly identifiable in, in an <coughs> open ocean environment, especially for shipping. That's that's one of our main main issues when a fad goes missing. It's quite often from ships that go through. Uh, need to provide structure for fish to aggregate around. Need to make sure there's no rope floating on the surface. The last thing we want is for a boat to go through and cut off these fads. And also need to minimise entanglement with passing cetaceans. So fortunately to this day we haven't had a single whale entanglement in New South Wales waters. Here's the design we use. So the, the yellow boys there, they're 80 centimetres in height. They weigh about 30 kilos dry weight. Uh, with a, a special mark, so we've got a flashing light, uh, one flash every five seconds on them. The, below that, we have a, a ballast chain of around 10 metres in length. The Queensland guys are using about 20 metres now. We, we might move towards that just because quite often when, when one gets cut off, it's, it's at that top section of rope. And it could even be from braided lines on occasions. So we might, might look to trial a few uh, longer chains next year. Below that, we've got the sinking rope. And the bottom section is a um, neutrally buoyant rope, just to keep it off the bottom. We're looking about three times the depth of the water is the length. And at the bottom of it, we have about 40 kilos of chain and either a 45 or a, or a 55 pound Danforth style anchor. In recent years, we've mo moved to fitting them with GPS trackers. So this has been really important. Um, we, know, we know when the fads are on station and as soon as one's gone missing, we get out there to replace it so fishers don't waste their fuel by turning up and find there's none present there. Uh, certainly, yeah, created efficiencies with, with recovering. And um, what we also do is we update the locations and the status of the fads on our website and also on the, on the Fish Smart app. So it's worth jumping on that one, have a look at it. And yeah, we always encourage fishers to check the status of these before they do run out to sea, especially when they're, they're quite large, uh, quite long runs. And we also attach uh, acoustic listening units to quite a few of them too. So especially with some of the, the white shark monitoring, working out where, where these sharks are heading. Yeah, as I mentioned before, historically we used to do all the deployments and the retrievals, two fads at a time though, it was, yeah, it took a hell of a lot of time just traveling all over the state. In more recent times, we've moved to offload to commercial fishers and to charter fishers. So some of these are able to hold up to 20 fads on deck and complete half the coast in two days. So it's certainly been very handy for the program. With the tracking I mentioned before, we use Tracer Track. So we get two pings a day with the, with the GPS trackers. You can see on the right hand side there, that's a, the one off Sydney Harbour. Um, we've got a geo fence set up with a 500 metre radius. So if a fad goes outside of that, we get an alert. Uh, 8 a.m. and midday are the two alerts we get. So if, they are, if, if we get on the water in the morning, work out exactly where it is and pick it up around midday. So on the left there, that fad went missing about three weeks ago. And you can see it from down south there, works its way up to or Stockton Bight, up north of Newcastle. And um, we just had to wait for a weather window and we could get out there, retrieved it, and we are back in action. There's the Fish Smart app on the left there. So there's a map on there, you can zoom in, click on any of the fads. You can see in the middle there, it just says the location of them, the coordinates, and, and if it's on station or not. We often push to oh, Facebook posts. Um, we've got a newsletter that goes out as well, just to, to keep the people interested. We often run a, a photo competition as well. So submit a good photo, especially if there's a fad in the background and, and get a T-shirt. When it comes to site selection, uh, really have to, a whole lot of careful consideration of commercial shipping routes. As I mentioned before, that's one of the, the main reasons why, why we'll lose fads. You can see on the right there, that's the, the density tracks of, of ships. So we're, we're right, in the, right in the zone with them. But they're all present on, on charts. And uh, if you zoom in on that, you can actually see where the ships go around them and they, they typically avoid the fads. Uh, commercial fishing operations are very important as well, especially when it comes to the, the trawl fishers. 
uh, consultation is pretty full on at times, just finding a suitable location where we're not going to impact upon their, their activities. And we seek endorsement from a, a number of different agencies. This includes AMSA, uh, Roads and Maritime Services in New South Wales, Royal Australian Navy, Port Authority, uh, Australian Hydro Hydrographic Office as well. Probably, yeah, the, the main conflict that we see on the FADs is between anglers and spearfishers, uh, especially if spearfishers turn up and put a dive flag up and then others can't fish in the vicinity. So uh, we've got a code of, code of conduct online that we, we encourage people to follow. Uh, commercial fishers, typically we don't have too many issues. We've had, we have had in recent months at one location up the north coast and with that, we haven't introduced formal closures around the FADs yet. Uh, we'll do it if we have to, but typically it's a case of phone the commercial fisher, say these are put in place with recreational fishers fees, and um, they're a main audience that we want to see using them. Uh, I won't bore you too much with the legislative requirements, but back in the day, we had to get a, an exemption certificate through the Commonwealth Sea Installations Act. Back in 2014, several sections of that act were repealed, so we no longer need to do that but we need to adhere to the air requirements of the Commonwealth's EPBC Act. Um, we have a review of on environmental factors, which we, we regularly update if there's any new sites. And the key with that is that we can demonstrate that there's no significant impacts on matters of national environmental significance or, or other protected matters. Now to the fun part, a few fish there. So the 2022-23 season started up the North Coast. These are off Port Stephens about three weeks ago. Uh, we've had some really good water there and, and some really good dolphin fish action there. Uh, south Coast is really kicking into gear now, so it's a little bit later once the current gets down there. Just a couple of pointers. Uh, fads are they're rel relatively inexpensive, but they are labour intensive compared to artificial reefs. Um, they're not the perfect answer for all species and they won't satisfy every target group. So you, you look at a lot of people with a small tinny, so they can't get out there and so on, but we're yeah, offshore fishers, they love them and we're certainly going to roll on with the program. Uh, they're definitely a true aggregation tool. So we often hear about the aggregation and productivity debate, which especially with artificial reefs, but these are just a, a true aggregation tool to provide new fishing opportunities for fishers. Uh, they can provide a shift in angler habits. Uh, charter, a lot of the charter operators love them because it, it gives them an opportunity to give a lot of the reefs a break, go across and, and chase some pelagics during the season. And probably the, the take home message is with consultation with commercial fishing sector. Um, it's a headache, but you have to do it. And if you <laughs> get offside, you can get a ropes cut and you, you don't want any of that. So anyway, thanks for your time. And my voice has just made it. <laughs>
But in New South Wales, our, um, our objective is to create high quality, productive habitat to provide additional recreational fishing opportunities to those large endless expanses of soft sediment, soft sandy areas. And to do this, we use purpose built structures from steel and or concrete. I won't labour on this too much. I think a few people from New South Wales have covered this. We're really lucky in New South Wales. We've got um, a really strong um, recreational fishing um, trust body. We've got a fishing licence. Those fees go into programs such as the recreational uh, artificial reefs. And uh, segues for me to come down to Melbourne and tell you all about it. By way of a brief history, we um, the uh, the whole pr proposal of using offshore artificial reefs spiked around the 50s and 60s, dominated generally by the use or at the time disposal of materials of opportunity with sort of little little regard to the long-term environmental impacts. This ne led to a negative perception of reefs and uh, loss of in interest in investment and it wasn't until the mid-90s where we started to see the error of our ways and develop environmentally responsible reef structures um, which increased obviously the renewed interest in the research investment um, and led to the fisheries enhancement programs we've got today. So a quick tour around Australia. There's um, a lot of activity obviously on the east coast, um, Western Australia. I hope you all saw James Florison's talk. He, he gave a really good talk and some really excellent examples of how we can repurpose some materials in an environmentally responsible way and produce some really fantastic habitat from that um, existing offshore structures that we have in place. We're not that fortunate in, um, in the east. Um, even if we did, and, and people do ring up, for, for me it's really a question of is it, is it quality habitat, like what is the structure, often it's, um, sometimes it's concrete blocks, um, and, and also to fit in with our program I think the, um, the cost benefit doesn't really weigh out with um, transport preparation and, and installation of, of those sorts of structures. So there's a bit of activity up in Northern Territory as well, I see online they're using um, a lot of materials opportunity as well and um, also here in Victoria inside the heads they've got a great one to hold the kingies, to try and hold the kingies out of, and the fishes out of the um, shipping channels and also down in Tasmania. So what works for us in New South Wales? Well, in the early 2000s, um, Heath Fulp and Mick Lowry got together, I believe, and um, basically come up with a bit of a winning combination of, of considering three main areas. Um, first of all, what is our objective? Really, really high quality habitat, holding fish, um, recreation of targeted fish, and answer some of those research questions, um, draw down aggregation production. Um, what's the fishing pressure? There's some, there's some feeling out there that um, uh, that because you put an artificial reef in, suddenly there's a, a spike in six metre boat sails. There's not. We're basically spreading existing effort and giving recreational fishers an um, additional opportunity, hopefully close to safe harbour. Um, physical constraints and responsibilities, I'll come back to that a little bit later. It's the bulk of my talk on, um, on stability. And socioeconomic, we get really good feedback from our stakeholders that uh, this is a, a recent social return on investment study and we got some good numbers there showing that um, fishers are using the reefs, they, they claim to want to fish more because they know there's a reef out there and, and they're happy with their, their money being spent on, on these purpose built reefs. Um, engaging the stakeholders, this is probably arguably one of the most important parts of, of site selection for artificial reefs. There's a lot of marine estate um, users out there. Um, and a lot of um, resources, time of preparation and, and, and money goes into site selection and, um, and preparing an application for a CW permit which is managed by the Commonwealth. Um, so having a really good idea of what, what's out there, what soft sediments are available, obviously soft sediments are still an important ecological community in the, in the marine estate. Um, staying away from natural reef, we, we sort of got an unwritten policy, we stay at least 500 metres away from natural reef to reduce those drawdowns effects. There, there is a paper that talks to that and we found that the, uh, it, it shows that um, those drawdown effects fall off at about 400 metres, hence our 500 metre buffer. Um, and just ensuring that we're not, um, we're, we're maximising our, um, our delivery with and minimising the impact to our stakeholders, so commercial fishers, um, diving groups, a lot of government um, agencies as well. We've got um, NOPSEMA, mining, um, submarine cables, the list goes on. And defence, defence is a big one for us as well defence practice areas. So what are we actually putting down? What can I tell you about our reefs? Well, they rock and they're really, really heavy. We've got 
Um, we've got reefs that range from our concrete modules about 26 ton each unit and our steel structures range from uh, 50 ton up to uh, 130 ton. And how do we influence the design? So for us, we basically, through our consultation period, we'll, we'll go out and we'll show the recreational fishers in the, the, the locals to the, the site that's been selected, the region. We'll show them the, the, the previous reefs and do a little bit of a presentation like this to talk about what's working, what's not working and, and, and what they would like in their area. These days, it's often we want two steel towers. So how do we ensure those steel towers are going to be um, fit for purpose, stable over the life cycle um, and produce fish? Then we, are, we, we go to a coastal processes. We, we have coastal engineers write us a coastal processes report. So they basically forecast what conditions we are going to experience it at this location in one in 100 year storm event. Really conservative numbers up there, and we actually provide that to our contractors in a, um, in a tender. So, and we'll basically say, look, we want two steel towers. They've got to be maximum of 12 metres in height, so to ensure we've got safe vessel clearance. Um, and these are the figures that we want you to prove your design will withstand in a one in 100 year storm event. Now, the investment on the contractor's behalf to provide that in a tender is a little bit too much to ask. So they'll basically come to us with a design. We'll sit down with a panel of people from coastal, process, uh, coastal um, engineers, naval architects, um, public works, and Alistair Becker, and decide um, which is best suited for our purposes. The contract will be awarded and then the, the, the first milestone is for them to go away and prove those stability calculations. Now, when they might come, they might come back and have factors of safety that aren't, um, that don't cut the mustard for us. So that might mean squashing the main body, having the pelagic towers higher, lowering the centre of gravity, putting some more habitat around the base of it. So there is a bit of um, toing and froing working with industry there to get the, um, the design right. And then we basically um, get them to um, provide us with factors of safety. So. Got a little table there with factors of safety with, under conditions that I mean you might someone probably looking at that and going well 0.9 is not a factor of safety at all but that's showing us that it will withstand those forces one on 100 year storm event in very very unlikely scenario so you've got no marine growth there and 30 years of surface corrosion. So where are our reefs and what do they look like? We've got nine currently in the water spanning from. Um, border to border from Tweed Heads right up in the north to Marimbula down in the south. <clears throat> Those green ones, there are nine ones that are in the water. I'm currently working on the Foster and Terrigal projects, which we hope to have in the water by the end of next year now, a few delays. Um, uh, just quickly, the Tweed Heads one up the very top there, we've got that big steel structure, that's called a, well, a fish grotto or a bird cage, some people are calling it. Um, that thing's producing fish really, really well. That is stacked with Spanish spotted mackerel, cobia, yellow tie, kingfish, um, amberjack, samson fish, Malawi pearl perch, um, and a range of those species are holding all those reefs down the coast. There was a lot of um, interest from spearfishing groups up there, so we, that's actually a steel structure surrounded by concrete modules. So we created a bit of a field and tried to get into depths where, well, the higher end of, um, of um, capable spearfishers could access anyway. And then coming down the coast, yeah, we've got whole fields in uh, Port Macquarie of concrete modules. Um, the steel structure hanging from the crane there in the middle, that's the, what, the Sydney one, the first one that went in in 2011. Uh, and then those other steel structures are um, Marimbilla, Newcastle, Wollongong and Batemans Bay. Um, and we've found that working with industry, these designs are giving us real bang for buck. They are getting bigger and more intricate and more... Um, more high quality habitat niche, little niche um, areas to target those recreational fishing, uh, recreational targeted species. Um, all our reefs range from 25 to 50 metres in depth. Um, we find the towers work really well, out, out a bit wider, deeper water, higher currents, high influence from that AAC current coming through. We've also got nine estuarine reefs um, across six different systems. Um, we've got clusters of anywhere between 50 to 500 reef balls, concrete reef balls. Uh, they are also working really well. It's funny, I get a lot of, I feel a lot of phone calls from fishers saying, oh, your reef balls aren't working, and then the very next phone call is, oh, I had such a great time out there, and I caught this and that, and what, what the other, and it's, 
there's fishing right there, isn't it? Like we get some, we get some really negative um, feedback, and then the next day we get some really positive feedback. Oh, thank you. Um, proven results. So I tried to crunch some big numbers, which I haven't done in a while, and I was pretty happy with how they came out. So I used some pretty conservative figures for measuring um, what cubic meterage we've got of all of our structures. I included the Foster and Terrigal ones for next year. Um, we've got over 34,000 square metres of, um, of habitat, um, applying some really cool work that um, Alistair Becker did, um, showing that we can get up to three times the, um, the footprint of the reefs as a um, productive biological footprint. Um, that gives us well over 100,000 um, cubic metres or 42 Olympic swimming pools. Uh, it's just an image of the first reef that went in off Sydney. Um, so how big are they? Um, that's me down there at 1.8. We've got the concrete modules are four by four by five metres high. Some of them have a pelagic tower off them, which is really good for holding kingfish. And then we move, and then moving into those steel structures, which um, yeah, this is a. a, a earlier design from Subcon. They're about 6 by 8 by 12, I think, for memory. Um, and moving on, the Batemans Reef saw a lot of changes. Dr Ian Southers from the University of New South Wales got involved with, a, um, with a, one of our contractors and um, looked at what, what's worked and what hasn't worked and have further developed the design. They bought themselves um, a fair bit of money out of the budget that we have for these reefs by getting rid of the use of, of cranes and heavy lifting at sea. So removing cranes and barges straight away frees up a lot of budget. And what they've done to get around that is um, sort of an offshore uh, installation method. They've put chambers in them so that we can float them, t wet tow them into place, and then open a couple of valves and they have a nice controlled descent to the bottom. Um, and again, steel is really offering us a lot of flexibility in creating some really cool niche habitats in different designs. You see, we've got some um, rock cages and all sorts of different nooks and crannies. Uh, the latest the water design is an iteration of the um, Eurobadala reef. Um, as I said before, this one came back, and because of the higher um, currents and velocities we've got off Terrigal and Foster, um, they've squashed the main body of the design, and it's, that's actually now a footprint of 15 by 15 by 12. So that's it. this is our biggest ones yet. Uh, benefits, there was a study done on um, trips out to the reefs, um, 9.3 trips a day to the Sydney reef um, and um, obviously associated economic activity um, Yeah, fulfilling social benefits really and, and, and just that, that broader um, aspect of getting fishes involved. Some sexy pictures here. Unfortunately, I don't have any as nice and crystal clear as um, James did, but I managed to get some of the kingies and a whole heap of yellowtail scud. Uh, that's one of our reefs coming out of the warehouse for a bit of scale there. Reef planning and approval. This is probably consuming 95% of my life at the moment. There's a lot of changes. It's really, really highly regulated activity in Australia, and there's um, some changes afoot, which some of you in the audience would be well, well aware that I'm very passionate about. <laughs> so we're, um, we're providing a lot of input there as well. Um, Bit more scale there, nice sexy picture with the, um, the Sydney Harbour Bridge in the background of the Eurobadala reefs, and that's the Port Mac deployment. And I would never have a presentation without Ben and his big black barcode. Um, Alistair, Alistair talked to those earlier today. So that's all from me. Thank you very much, and thanks to the Recreational Fishing Trust and um, those that have input into our successful design. Thank you. Um, we'll get every all the speakers to sit down here, and then we'll start with the questions. I think. Oh, yeah, Taylor's back. Craig. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Yep. Hello. Chris, um, million dollar question. How much for those big steel ones? And are you finding that 
There's a lot of steel in them, I suppose, with the cost of steel going like that. Is that providing any or creating any difficulties? It has. The budgets remained unchanged since before my time, probably six, eight years. Um, when I come on board, I could see this coming with some of my previous experiences, and I, that's why I started doing two at a time. Uh, it was an easy option, but um, they want more money. Just to create a bit of economy of scale for the um, marine contractors, because of course, once you start mobilising barges and cranes and tubs and things. Um, and that has worked um, up until now, and the next round, which is uh, Coffs and Ballina, we've managed to get another two, three hundred thousand. Yeah, so I don't think I answered the question, did I? The, these are one million each for the two towers per site. Yeah, one point one. Matthew, just wait for the microphone, please. Uh, Chris, um, what's the projected lifespan of the reefs? Uh, and, well, concrete versus steel too, I suppose. Good question. Um, is it on or is this just the recorder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Sorry. Uh, projected lifespan. So corrosion rates under these conditions are pretty grey area, really, depending on salinity and temperature and things. Obviously, the growth slows things down. Um, you can apply a corrosion rate to one side of the steel, both sides of the steel. If it's closed, obviously you can get away with only one. So you can then say, well, six, but the, we're not we're not supporting a, a structure, a bridge, um, you know, a, a ferry dock or anything. So ours are between 30 and 50 to answer the question. Um, and that basically depends on the construction. Um, but, you know, at the end of 30, 50, 60 years, it's going to be obviously a reef in its own right. So. Oh, yep, there's two down the back. There's three other people, four other people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, this is for uh, Chris and Ben. Uh, can, can you tell us, uh, in the context of New South Wales, but I know it's similar for Victoria and South Australia, what the local recreational community has to do first before uh, assessment, design de and deployment happens? What do they have to do to get a reef? Yeah, so we... In recent years, we've run a statewide expression of interest process. So through that one, it was all about just finding where the interest was. We then go a step further and desktop analyses, just working out if there's suitable ports, if there's other infrastructure in the way and so on. Um, the Bateman's Reef in particular, you can probably answer it better than, than any of us. But, uh, <laughs> yeah... No, the, the community loves the things and that's the main thing. Uh, one at the back. Uh, another one for you, Chris. <laughs> Popular guy. Uh, Sven... Uh... <laughs> Uh, look, I, I saw the second half of the presentation. Apologies, I didn't see the first bit. Uh, what I saw very inspiring uh, in Tassie, where we're, we're sort of like starting uh, in the uh, artificial reef space. Um, so we're sort of you know, assessing our options going forward, uh, assuming we have some money. Um, but uh, anyway, my question is, uh, in, t in terms of the, um, the artificial reefs, such as like the Reef Temple, which are primarily designed to attract pelagics, um, what's the effectiveness of those reefs compared to a much cheaper option like FADS? Well, I guess um, I think Ben might have covered that a little bit. The, the, your fads are um, obviously seasonal and attracting fish, whereas your offshore artificial reefs, obviously, you've got their uh, much longer lifespan and they're, they're, they're producing fish once they're established. Um, yeah, you're right. There's a very big difference in cost there. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, does that, does that answer the question? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, look, obviously, yeah. if it's a, it's a, uh, it's a nice little of fish, then uh, Yeah. Yeah, but you're going to take them out seasonally for maintenance and 
lose them and you're going to have dramas with ships. And I don't know that we've... Do we find that the ones in Sydney, the paired ones, they don't necessarily... Like, because we've got a cluster of fads, they don't attract more fish. It just spreads the fishing effort. Like, they've, they've got as many fish as the single ones. Um, but with a reef structure as well, I mean, like you say, you've got that, you've got that bottom structure whether it's concrete or steel, that are holding demersals. And then if you've got towers off them, they will be there year round to hold pelagics as well as they're passing through. Yeah, my, I guess the species as well. So our fads are primarily for dolphin fish. Um, they'll attract kingfish, but normally they'll be 40, 50 centimetres in size. The reefs, on the other hand, you can get 20 kilo kings on there. So there's a, a big difference in the, the species you get, get on each one. I think David was next. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, my question was probably related to design as well. We're talking about productivity. In my experience, because I'm doing like living reefs, shellfish reefs, the surface area is really important. And the fact that you guys are putting trays of rocks and things underneath, probably for a number of reasons, but that increased surface area, uh, that's just got to work, hasn't it? It's like. Uh, but is that also to get, when you're floating them out, get uh, the centre of gravity back down as well, get more weight down the bottom and like double whammy, you know? Yeah, all that's factored into design, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's coming with any design. Yeah, you're getting your steps up, aren't you? Toothbrush. Uh, yes, that's factored into design, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think David was next. Thank you. Um, this is for Ben and or Chris. Um, yeah, I was just interested to, to know whether there are any fads or artificial reefs for commercial fisheries. I, I can see an argument where you say, well, you're making it easier for wreck fishers to, to fish. W why not commercial fishers? You, you could reduce uh, a carbon footprint, less fuel being used, higher safety standards because you're not going further out to sea. That there's kind of lots of arguments you could make um, to say, well, if it's uh, viable for wreck fishing, why is it not viable for commercial fishing? Uh, having their own fads or, or reefs. Yeah. <coughs> I'll take this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, the um, with the uh, our main funding source in, as recreational fisheries managers is coming through the recreational fishing license fee, so they're our, our main stakeholder. Um, there hasn't really been a push for commercial ones, not to say it couldn't, but again, they come down to funding streams. But has anyone from the industry, fishing industry ever raised this? No, not with us. Yeah, not at all. We seek your voice, Chris. I think Ben. Oh. I'm going to buck the trend and let the northerners have a breather. Um, <laughs> Brent, um, I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time underwater with you on these reefs. 
Um, and I just thought it might be nice to expand a little bit on the what we've seen down there in regards to the natural recruitment of those oysters and what those reefs have become um, on their own merit as well. Um, they're pretty incredible spots to hang out on, even when we do kick up all the silt. But um, yeah, I thought it might be good for you to just give them a bit of a background on some of the amazing stuff we do see down there. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ben. Uh, what we found is we probably we created habitat through the rock in itself, and that became a substrate for. We're thinking that the oysters that settled on there might have been from other reefs itself. So we did add oysters on those reefs, but in the end, the oysters were actually attached to the basalt rock, especially in the corners. Um, yeah, with an impressive amount of numbers. And it might have been just from that settlement or increased from the oysters we did put on. So, yeah. They're easier to lose, but the, clo the more you look, the more oysters you did see. Yep. As a follow on question, um, I, I might have misinterpreted. Um, your, one of your slides about the, the monitoring program that you're putting in place, it indicated two years worth of monitoring. Um, I'm wondering if you think that's sufficient, um, you know, particularly, it seems it's a pretty silty environment, a lot of sedimentation, and how you might kind of account for the projected longevity of, of, that, of that project. Yeah, that's a good question. That's, I suppose it c comes down to funding as well. We can increase um, the monitoring probably economically through krill surveys. We've got a lot of people doing um, surveys around the, and that's as far as the catch is concerned. It's in a very convenient location and a good place to dive. So it's, I think it's within the interest of both fisheries and the rec dive sector to revisit. We have got a monitoring plan for two years, but I can't see why we can't continue going just to measure oysters and um, survey the fish over time. But as, as, as you're stating, the, the longer the monitoring program, the better. Yep, I agree. I'll, I'll get away from the reefs. Uh, Taylor, so Macquarie Perch, uh, like obviously you're at the point now where you're fairly close to closing the gap on breeding them consistently, like, yeah, like consistently in a hatchery. Once, you've, once you go to that point, are like, is everything else set in stone once you've restocked everywhere? Like, is everything else set up to ensure the constant survival? Because obviously things have degraded massively. They're degrading in the era in terms of population. What factors are facing... Like, what other factors aside from fish stocking? Like, is everything right to go? Is it, yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the question, Mitch. Um, we're not quite, we haven't cracked the code yet, but we've got a plan and we think we've almost got the funding together to do it in the next three years. And that, that still won't be easy, but we think um, we can do it with the right team. Uh, yeah, to answer your question, are the other pieces of the puzzle there? We think so. Like the, the habitat restoration, the investment that the CMA's put in at the moment and the state government in the habitat initiatives, there's, there's heaps of... Um, connection between populations occurring. Again, we're getting fishways in places, we're re-snagging. We've got a good understanding of the genetics of the species and uh, we've got some good population monitoring so we can set the um, regulations appropriately. So it feels like all the other pieces are there, but the issue is with the um, declining populations now, unless we can re-establish these other ones, we'll lose them. That, that's why I think this is really the last piece of the puzzle to get. So it's exciting that um, we seem to have common ground, that we're all on that same page, raised awareness, um, co-investment support. Now we just need to crack the code and get on with it. Uh, it won't be quick though, you know, like it might take us three years to do it and then we're going to have to breed them for a few years. Like this might be 10, 15 years before we're, you know, really getting populations back and then eventually opening for, for fishing. But uh, yeah, it's critical time now and um, we think we're close. Thanks for the question. So we probably have time for one more question, but if you do have any more questions, you can talk to the presenters at the next break or at the conclusion of the conference. So is there one more? Yep, at the back.
Um, sorry, Karina, I was trying to line one up for you, but I'm going to hit Ben while I can. <laughs> um, uh, really quick one. Uh, a lot of your fad design changes have seemed to be fairly been based around engineering design. Um, have you ever trialled anything around, you know, making the habitat better in terms of um, non-synthetic, you know, hemp rope or something to act like kelp or augmentation or different um, anchor designs? And also, if you had one other piece of advice for other jurisdictions entering the FAD area or that are having issues in the FADS area, what would that be? Yeah, we, like hemp rope and this and that, we haven't looked at that at all. Um, these simple designs seem to be working. So just having that large boy there, it's as simple as that, it's all we need in the water. Sometimes it can be a matter of one or two days and the fish have already found it and they, they're on there. A lot of people seem to think that you need more growth on there to bring the dolphin fish in, but it, it certainly doesn't seem to be the case. So a simple design and main thing with those is that we're able to retrieve them. Uh, they're a manageable size, plus they are definitely large enough and they are working. Um, main piece of advice, uh, probably the site selection is a key one. There's been a lot going on at a Commonwealth level recently from trawl fishing sector and from uh, the longline fishers as well over a couple of the other states with some site selection where the, these commercial operators didn't agree. Uh, now there's a lot of heat on us to, as I was mentioning before, we've got no, um, we don't need those exemption certificates under the Sea Installations Act that used to be required. We can run off our own REF. Um, a lot of the, the Commonwealth um, commercial sector, they're looking at, they're pushing pretty hard to really ramp that up. So they, they want us to be more accountable for where we put them in. And that's something that's, that could be coming soon. So certainly that consultation and getting it right with the commercial operators is, is very important. Perfect. Thank you everyone for coming for the last session. Um, I'd just like to give a round of applause for the speakers. So now we have the afternoon tea break um, going for 20 minutes and then it's the final um, key, special keynote. Thank you.